Now, there's nothing that film fans love more than going back to revisit a movie and suddenly realizing something that they've never noticed before. And failing that, it's learning about a sneaky Easter egg from a friend or online community such as the fine folk over on the Movie Details Reddit thread. Now, these details may be cute Easter eggs or impressive feats of continuity, or they might well be shocking mistakes that somehow you've never even noticed before, but now will never be able to not notice. Yeah, that's right. Simply put, after these secrets are brought to your attention in this video, you'll never be able to watch these horror movie moments quite the same way again, whether for better or for worse. But let's get on with the video as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 horror movie moments impossible to watch the same way after this video. Number 10. The actor who played the radiographer is a future murderer, The Exorcist. Early on in The Exorcist, you'll likely remember that the young Reagan is sent for a battery of medical tests to try and determine the cause of her increasingly erratic and concerning behavior. The various procedures were mimicked on screen by actual medical personnel, including Paul Bateson, a real-life radiographer who plays the very same role throughout Reagan's treatment. But in 1979, six years after the movie's release, Bateson was convicted of murdering film journalist Addison Verrill and sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. Worse still, the authorities believe that Bateson may have also carried out the killings of several other gay men living in Manhattan at the time, though they have never been able to actually prove it. Ultimately, Bateson was released on parole in 2003, and there's no public record of his whereabouts since 2008, where his parole term was completed. This knowledge certainly makes watching the hospital sequence that much more unsettling, well aware that one of the people taking part in it murdered at least one person a few years years later. Number 9. Danny's parents were still alive when she calls Midsummer. Ari Aster's stellar second feature, Midsummer, begins with one of the most harrowing opening sequences in any recent horror film, with protagonist Danny receiving a disturbing series of messages from her mentally ill sister. Though encouraged to brush it off as attention-seeking behavior by her boyfriend Christian, Danny later receives a phone call confirming that her sister has not only killed herself, but also killed their parents by filling their family home with car monoxide. It's a deeply disturbing sequence and one that sets an uneasy tone for the rest of the movie, yet only on repeat viewings are you likely to realize the even more horrifying truth of that opening. You see, earlier in that scene, Danny calls her parents and we catch a glimpse of them as they appear to be sleeping soundly, but of course, in reality, they've seemingly already succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. Yet, if you look closely, you can actually see that the parents are still breathing. Their chests move slightly as Danny calls them suggesting that if Christian hadn't discouraged Danny from investigating the issue further, their lives could have actually been saved. Had Danny kept calling, maybe her parents may have even woke up, or had she pursued the matter further, she could have summoned help in time. In turn, this would have not only saved her parents' lives, but also ensured that Danny never took her ill-fated trip to Sweden. Number 8. The Dead Twins Are An Homage To The Shining Us Jordan Peele's two horror movies to date boast a frankly ridiculous amount of attention to detail, rewarding the most eagle-eyed viewers with both ingenious foreshadowing and smart nods to classic entries in the genre. Case in point, in Peele's second feature, Us, Adelaide's friends Josh and Kitty Tyler have a pair of twin daughters. When the Tyler's doppelgangers slaughter the family, Peele cuts to a shot of the twin daughters dead in the hallway, which while at first glance is a seemingly standard shot choice, is actually a visual nod to Stanley Kubrick's the Shining. The Shining, of course, features the most iconic pair of twins in horror history, the Gradys, who were slaughtered by their father while he served as the caretaker of the Overlook Hotel. The position of the Tyler twins' bodies in Us is almost exactly the same as the unforgettable shot of the Grady twins in The Shining, right down to the most precise positioning of their limbs. There's no way that this wasn't intentional, and yet only the most die-hard Shining fans will likely ever notice it. Number 7. The Visible Fog Machine – Insidious Though you might already know about the ghost boy hidden in plain sight during Insidious's creepy tiptoe through the tulip scene, you probably never spotted a fog machine that is parked in the bottom of the frame in another scene. At roughly 82 minutes into the film, when Josh Lambert is walking towards the red door in the further, keep an eye on the far left side of the shot, and you should be able to make out the source of all of that fog that is flooding the frame. Yes, that's right, it's a fog machine that's giving the scene some supernatural atmosphere. Now, how easily you'll be able to see this machine will depend entirely on your own TV or device's brightness, as well as its contrast in gamma settings, but once you know it's there, you'll think about it every time you watch this scene. Number 6. Alfred Hitchcock makes a cameo from Beyond the Grave – Psycho 2 
Though Psycho 2's mere existence was seen as sacrilegious upon its original 1983 release, esteem for the sequel has definitely grown over time, even as fans accept that it doesn't get close to matching the thrills of Alfred Hitchcock's 1960s original. It didn't help Psycho 2's rep that it released barely three years after Hitchcock's death in 1980, with some seeing it as a disrespectful attempt to cash in on his legacy. But Hitchcock's daughter Patricia gave the project her blessing, and Hitchcock's student Richard Franklin was picked to direct the film as a tribute to his mentor. The film as such includes a number of nods, both subtle and overt, to the late filmmaker, including a brilliant one when Norman Bates and Mary Loomis first enter Norman's mother's bedroom. In the moment before they turn the lights on, keep your eye on the right-hand side of the frame and you'll be able to see a distinctive silhouette of Hitchcock himself, inspired by his silhouetted profile used in the 1950s anthology series Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Given Hitchcock's iconic tendency to make cameo appearances in his own movies, this was a fun way to put him in the film despite his death, and it was slight enough that it blends easily into the shadowy environment. Number 5. James McAvoy has a swollen hand from punching a door during filming. Split. James McAvoy gives a phenomenal performance in M. Night Shyamalan's Split, playing Kevin Wendell Crumb, a man affected with dissociative identity disorder to the extent that he juggles 24 conflicting personalities. However, there's a scene in the movie where Crumb removes his glasses, and if you pay close enough attention, you might notice that his hand is horribly swollen for some reason. While at first viewers could just pawn this off as a physical change brought about through Crumb's personality switching, a phenomenon that is confirmed itself in the film, the truth is considered more strange and painful. In reality, James McAvoy actually injured his hand on set whilst performing a scene where he had to punch a metal door. McAvoy was supposed to hit the soft padded part of the door but missed his mark and hit the metal full pelt instead. Though McAvoy didn't need a hospital visit for the injury, he was treated for swelling before continuing with the shoot, hence why his hand has ballooned so much in the aforementioned scene. Number 4. Stephen King has the license plate from Christine. It Chapter 2. Though you get no points for spotting Stephen King's amusingly on-the-nose cameo appearance as a pawn shop owner in IT Chapter 2, the scene does contain an incredibly sneaky easter egg that will get the minds of King's fans positively whirring. When King's character talks to Bill, a number of car license plates are visible behind King, including a yellow one bearing the string CQB241. This is the very same license plate that was used for the murderous 1958 Plymouth Fury in John Carpenter's 1983 adaptation of King's novel Christine, which beyond being a cute reference seems to suggest that, at one point in time, this pawn shop owner himself seemingly had possession of Christine. Number 3. The Journal Has a Rude Message from a Disgruntled Crew Member The Fog from one John Carpenter movie to another now with his 1980 cult classic horror The Fog, which boasts one of the greatest all-time examples of a crew member placing their own sneaky creative stamp on a movie moment. In the scene where Father Malone reads from his grandfather's journal, ignore the narration and actually take a look at what was messily scrawled on the page. The only sometimes legible text is clearly a rant from a member of the movie's prop team complaining about wasting their college education and that their work on this film consists of writing dumb shit in this f***ing movie prop. It's time to bring in the nude girls with the big tits, tattoos, and shaved beavers. Obviously, whoever wrote this assumed that audiences likely wouldn't pick up on it, but with The Fog getting a 4K release a few years back, it was just a matter of time before somebody noticed. Number 2. Willem Dafoe doesn't blink during the sea curse scene. The Lighthouse Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse is full of mesmerizing imagery and unforgettable moments, not while also providing an arguably career-best performance from Willem Dafoe as the unhinged lighthouse keeper Thomas Wake. And you'll probably remember the intense scene where Wake inflicts a sea curse upon his co-worker, Mr. Winslow. And as pointed out by Eggers himself, Dafoe doesn't blink throughout this entire sequence, which he shot in a single take. Though Eggers does briefly cut to Pattinson early on, there are 90-ish seconds where the camera is pointed only at Defoe, and indeed, he doesn't blink even once. To deliver such a stirring monologue while not blinking at all is a Herculean feat, and one that subtly imbues the scene with even more discomfort than you consciously realized. And number one, the microwave has a snake button. Snakes on a plane. 
Snakes on a Plane may seem like a pretty surface level horror comedy, but the filmmakers did manage to sneak one hilariously brilliant Easter egg in for those paying bafflingly close attention to such a gloriously dumb movie. When flight attendant Ken kills a snake by throwing it in a microwave and turning the appliance to high, for about a second we get a close up shot of the microwave's readout, where beyond the usual expected cooking options is a setting for snake. There's of course no tangible reason for a microwave to have this function, but it's a fun spot for anyone who notices it. Additionally, all of the microwave buttons on the left-hand column are clearly nothing more than stickers to the device that have been put on by the prop team, considering how they don't even line up properly with the other two columns. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 horror movie moments impossible to watch the same way after watching this video. Hope you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero, or you can swing by Instagram where it's the same handle, RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Hope to see you over there. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. I hope you're treating yourself well, my friend, with love and respect, because you deserve all the best things in life, all right? And don't let anyone or anything else tell you otherwise. You are a massive ledge, and I want you to go out there and absolutely smash it today. I believe in you. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.